Our moderator for the session is the wonderful Dion Niehoff, who is a public affairs and co corporate relations consultant for Droga and Van Drimmelen, and our coordinating ambassador for the Netherlands. Over to you, Dion. Good day. Thank you, Sephora. Good day, everyone. My name is Dionne. Um, I used to work at the National Parliament in the Netherlands, which is also here um, in my background. Um, and today I am uh, working as a public affairs professional, which means that I help organizations with their lobby, um, main, so to represent their interests towards parliament and other stakeholders. Um, I'm connected to One Your World. I'm the coordinating ambassador for the Netherlands, which I am so happy that I am able to do because I get to meet a lot of very interesting and inspiring young people. Um, but today we are going to talk about young people's participation in politics. Um, and I am very glad that I am in the company of two men with uh, very impressive resumes. Um, and I would like to introduce both of them to you, Dayo and Mette. Um, and Dayo, um, let's start with you. Dayo is the chief of staff um, in the House of Lords at the UK government. Uh, which means that he provides political, diplomatic and strategic insight to crossbench peers. Um, but Dayo is also uh, coming from a background of professional uh, basketball and he thinks that um, sports is an underused medium to um, increase social skills and to be used as a tool for education and change. Um, he has five years experience in the financial sector and he was also active in UNESCO. Uh, but today, he currently he's working at, as chief of staff, which is why I'm sure he has a lot of insight on today's topics and I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, Mette, you helped increase voter turnout in 2017 at the uh, Brexit elections and also in 2019 at the general elections uh, because you founded My Life, My Say uh, and the all-party parliamentary group on a better Brexit for young people. Uh, you are also at 21, you are 28 today, but at 21, the youngest ever elected councillor in the London borough of Hackney uh, and currently a cabinet member for energy, waste, transport and public realm. Uh, you also worked on the election campaign of mayor of London, Sadiq Khan's election campaign. So um, these two men who are in my company today are the perfect people to discuss this. Uh, we also don't need to ask you uh, if you think uh, uh, in politics is important because you're working uh, day and night to achieve it. And it leads me to my first question. Mete, you identified a problem in 2017 uh, because you started taking action. And I would like to ask you to share with us why a lack of youth representation is a problem. Yeah, firstly, let me uh, thank Cogex and One Young World and also you for your very kind introduction. I'm very flattered that I'm uh, classified as a Gen Z. I thought I was a millennial. Um, so I'll take that every year that I can uh, sort of get younger i'll definitely uh, sort of uh, take that one <laughs> um but in terms of uh, your question and um, specifically which is a very important one you know i think we live in a world where we've seen you know the coronavirus pandemic has exposed and amplified lots of inequalities across our society um disproportionately impacting young people um their mental health their jobs uh their, their families you know their social life and and that's why it's so important that young people are represented in politics because you know, if we live in a, a truly, um, you know, a representative democracy, we have to make sure that, you know, people from all groups and walks of back, backgrounds of life are represented in society. So for me, it's incredibly important that young people have a voice, you know, who knows what the future is going to hold in terms of, you know, how we come out of this pandemic. We talk about a greener recovery. We're speaking about, you know, the financial implications of the, um, that's being caused by the pandemic. And it's incredibly important that, you know, as we move towards building an equitable society, that young people have a voice to play. And I think we're still really far away from achieving that. Um, I think there have been some great examples, you know, not least to mention One Young World and the work that it does to connect, you know, decision makers in the highest of powers and, you know, young people. Uh, but I think there's a huge way to go in terms of representation. And I think having people like Dial, who is right at the heart of it as a chief of staff for in the Lords, um, is a really positive step, and I think we need much more of that. 
Yes, I fully agree with you. Um, Dio, um, uh, we uh, have a saying here at the office where I work, but also in politics in general. Uh, we say when you're not at the table, you are on the menu, which means that when you're not at the table where negotiations are taking place, no one is representing your interest. Um, would you like to reflect on that maybe and also coming from the work that you do and the things that you see on a daily basis and why the lack of youth representation is a problem? Yeah, um, thanks, Dion, um, and uh, thanks, Mete, for your comment. I think, uh, in honesty, and if I answer your, your last question first, you know, part of the problem is uh, the appeal and the persona uh, which is obviously deemed as political and what politics is. And uh, a lot of the myths that cloud us, uh, and a lot of the myths that cloud the youth is politics is something, you know, that's, that's elitist, that doesn't really make a difference, um, and that doesn't really solve some of the world's biggest issues, which is obviously uh, far away from the truth. But I think our biggest problem is the appeal. Um, and, and, and part of that issue is when you look at uh, the political sector, when you look at the spectrum, when you look at uh, Prime Minister's questions on TV, or when you look at the uh, House of Lords uh, chamber uh, question question time or, or, or questioning, what you'll see are different representations of, of different groups, but, but rarely representations of, uh, you know, one of the biggest groups in the world. So obviously young people are, are, are not at the center of political decisions, even though they make up half of the world's um, population. So half of the world's population is under 30. If, if you look at um, both houses, or the houses of government here in the UK are split into two. One is the Democratic House, which is the House of Commons, and these are the elected members. Uh, and, and the House I work in, which is the House of Lords, and these are obviously appointed. Now the House of Commons, um, you know, they have around 650 members of those 650 members, 3% uh, are between the ages of 18 to 29. Actually, it's less than 3%. We actually lump 18 to 29 and over 70 in the same group. So that group is probably about 1.7%. Uh, so 1.7% are young people in our current member of parliament. And kind of on a global scale, uh, you know, 6% of parliamentarians are under 35. And so visually, when you see this, um, you don't see representations of yourself and you don't see it as a place um, that is so welcoming or open to you. And I think part of the, you know, part of the bigger issues, and, and, and I'm sure we'll get to it when we go deeper into our conversation, part of a bigger problem is a lot of the issues which plague us today, um, such as mental health, such as uh, climate change. I mean, a lot of the issues that are plaguing us today are issues that affect young people and that are going to affect us in generations of futures to come. So it's important that we are actually at the table and not on the menu. Um, and, and if we continue going down the trajectory that we are on, uh, then the menu is going to be extremely big and, and, and we won't be uh, the, the people who are pulling the plugs and decisions. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, th those are very interesting figures. And indeed, if you try to see this and then compare it to what you actually see when you look at the demographic of your country and also of mine, um, that's a huge gap. Um, so um, let's move to what the underlying causes are, because um, I know that I love my job and I loved working at the parliament and in my spare time I um, campaign for the local political party here and I know that I don't have to convince you um, that being active in politics is actually something that's really fun and uh, exciting, but why are are our peers or why are people less interested in politics what do you think Mette? that's a really good question and you know i always say i don't think that young people aren't interested in the issues that affect them of course they care about whether they've got a decent job um, of course they care about whether they've got a decent roof over their shoulders i think the problem is is whether they see traditional forms of politics as a vehicle to address change and, you know, there's many reasons for that, but, you know, some of the main reasons, uh, they have touched on one of them, which is around sort of representation, which is that, you know, if you look at, look at people who represent us at both a national level, but also a local level, 
um, there's a huge uh, gap in terms of, you know, we know that it's dominated uh, mainly by older white men and, you know, not just for young people, but also women are, and ethnic minorities are incredibly underrepresented too. So, um, you know, when you look at those uh, chambers, you, there's an automatic barrier there. So we need to increase uh, representation. The other thing is, the clear one is for me, it's uh, education. So again, it's, it's being able to correlate the issues that you know that matter to you and how do you then use that or that enthusiasm and turn that into to activism and to, to actually go about making a change through the traditional means. And, you know, in the UK, we're not educated about how politics works. Um, you know, I always make the joke and of that, the fact that when I go to school or when I went to school, I learned about like, you know, periodic tables and stuff that I, I never learned about or I don't use in my day-to-day -day life now. But I never learned about, you know, voting, democracy, you know, my mortgage and all of these things that will help me with my day-to-day -day life. So it's really about going back to the drawing board in our education system and actually improving those life skills and those things that young people need so that, you know, it's not that they don't care, it's just how do you go about to, to sort of to do that. Um, and then the other third thing is, let's be honest, um, you know, a lot of politicians haven't helped themselves in many ways in the fact that they uh, promise and they don't deliver. And, you know, for a lot of people, this has obviously caused a massive uh, mistrust between younger people and politicians. We saw it with the, the tuition fees um, in the UK. We saw it with the Brexit referendum here as well, you know, without getting too political around it. You know, 75% of young people voted to remain um, complete contrary. And, you know, it's going to be our uh, generation is going to live with the, the outcome of Brexit. So, you know, it's this constant feeling and this resentment towards the this previous the older generations where it's you're feeling hard done by you know you weren't able to get on the housing ladder as easy as everyone else you weren't able to get a job as easy you didn't have free education like the, the baby boomers for example so you know there's there is a there is a sense of frustration from young people and again we're going through it now with the pandemic where we see lots of support rolled out for lots of different communities but again you know young people are, are being told you know hey, you know, well, you haven't had your vaccine, well, maybe you might not be able to travel because you haven't had it and you're not that priority or, you know, like it's, it's little things like this that I think, you know, pop young people off from uh, from politics. But ultimately, um, going back to what Dale said as well, I think it's incredibly important that we need young leaders uh, to step up uh, and to, to, to sort of take that charge and really inspire a whole new generation of young people to get involved in politics. Yes, I completely agree with you. And also, I think the um, COVID response um, is, is actually a great example because here in my country, uh, the focus on regulations and then lifting some of them was very much um, coming from a viewpoint of um, standard family life. So you were able to go to the movies or to a restaurant with, with your family. So all of my single friends living in Amsterdam and Rotterdam, they were not supposed to do anything because nobody was thinking about this huge group of young people living alone in the big city. So I think this is a great example of if you're not at the table, you are on the menu and nobody represents you. Um, Dayo, would you like to um, would you like to add something? Yes, um, I think uh, Mete, he drove home on some, some really uh, poignant points. Uh, just to give some more statistics. Um, so when we look at our own, when we look at UK politics, our own parliament here, the average age of an MP is 50 years old. And that's actually been... Um, the same for the past 50 years. So 50% of our our parliament constituency is, is over 50. Um, and again, I gave you the numbers in terms of uh, our, our young people, demographics about 1.7%. This is, this is out of 650 MPs. Now our youngest MP, um, uh, her name is uh, Nadia, she's from uh, Nottingham, Nottingham East, and she was 23 years old. Um, she was elected in 2019, our, our, our latest general election. Now, I, I saw one article in The Guardian uh, about her, but, but literally nothing, uh, nothing since. And, and I think, you know, we've, we've kind of missed a, a position here where we should have, you know, signposted her as, you know, uh, you know an example of, you know, a young person who is now prominently uh, at the table, at a prominent seat in, in Parliament and should encourage more people. But we haven't uh, seized this opportunity, and this seems to be a global, uh, you know, error and, and shift in in in, in our uh, thinking. 
You know, only 1.65% of parliamentarians around the world are in their 20s, and a third of the countries, um, their elig eligibility for entering the parliament, you have to be over 25. So we're actually missing a, a, a big shift here in terms of the value we see in terms of young people contributing into how our society and how our world is shaped. And I think, uh, you know, there needs to be a, a, a positive and a kind of radical shift where we actually, um, you know, start to infiltrate. Uh, and, and I love what uh, Mete said about the educational system, because uh, especially in the state and public school system, you know, we're not taught about politics. But if you look at the, the flip side, uh, you know, in, in, in private education, um, there kind of is a pipeline into the political system. And so if you look at the civil service numbers, around 80% of, 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 it's kind of 71% now, of civil service uh, or civil servants are from, are from private uh, education. 100% of our prime ministers are from private education. So th there needs to be some, some focus on these statistics and numbers uh, so that we can positively start infiltrating uh, and start educating uh, our young people on a, on a, on a mass scale. Yes, um, I agree. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, education is absolutely key. And what Meta said, you learn so much about things that you maybe don't always use the rest of your life. But it's 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 so weird in hindsight that you don't learn so much about um, politics and how it works, except for how many people are elected. Um, when are people over 18 allowed to vote? And then basically then that's it. But in the meantime, there are so many ways that you can make your voice heard. Um, and that moves me to uh, another thing. When I was preparing this session, um, I looked at the facts and figures. But at the same time, um, you see a rise of political activism in people our generation. So maybe they don't run for local office or run for parliament. Um, but after the election of Donald Trump, for example, there were protests all over Europe and the world, um, protests against hate. Um, the Women's March is huge here in the Netherlands and uh, also in your country. Uh, Fridays for Future, um, we have so many of those examples. Like, do you see this as a, um, as a positive thing? And maybe how can we use this energy and sort of integrate that into the political system that we already have? So how are we going to get this political activism into the places where decisions are actually being made? I think that that's, might be a very difficult question, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on it, Dio. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I'd like to make this point. Uh, activism and social advocacy is very different from political placement and political activity. So, so activism and social advocacy is very different from political placement and political activity. And what I mean by that is, yes, there has been a rise in activism and there has been a rise in, in social advocacy, and, and mainly because young people are passionate and interested in issues that confirm them as human beings and real issues that are at the touch and core of humanity. So uh, along with Black Lives Matter, along with the Women's March, along with climate change, a lot of these issues, young people are fed up of inactivity and they're fed up of you know, visibly seeing with their own eyes uh, the detriment of our society. And so you know, they're taken to the streets and they're, they're doing what they can, but understanding you know, everything has a place, everything works within a certain system and within a certain power of demographic. So, for example, um, you know, we've had Black Lives Matter marches all around the world, uh, here in the UK, USA, globally. However, little policy has changed. Um, in the USA, where, you know, the tragic uh, murder of George Floyd, which sparked the Black Lives Matter protests happened, there was little uh, reform from a policy level. So there was little uh, policy change or, or, or stuff that shifted within that dimension. And so it's all good to advocate and, and uh, you know, act, and, and activate and raise awareness. However, in order to sustain change and, and, and in order to uh, ensure that in the future, certain things don't replicate or repeat themselves, we have to establish policy. We have to establish legislation which uh, allows us to police uh, and, and disrupt these issues. And, and I'll give you a perfect example. As, as COVID began to accelerate, 
Um, you know, I, I was constantly coming here into the house of Lords and, and we actually pushed through uh, at a rapid pace legislation which actually governs how the police deal with COVID, how we deal with COVID, what our legal rights are. We actually uh, you know, pushed that through in Parliament within you know, a matter of weeks, and, and rightly so, because it, you know, it was a national crisis and national emergency. But it, you know, that is obviously now in law uh, and, and something that will govern how we react from henceforth. The problem I have with activism alone is it doesn't uh, change and establish much. And so there still is a need, there still is a call for young people to step past activism and step into political placement um, where they can actually not only have a voice, but make sure that voice is heard, make sure the voice uh, and actions which, which are spoken about are acted upon. Um, because too often we are echoing and, and we're shouting in, in the streets, but we're not being heard where decisions are being made and we're not at the table where actually decisions and, and, and law is being established. And so I, I really challenge uh, us to take a step up from activism and really step into uh, political placement. Um, Mete, what do you what do you think? How can we use this um, or capitalize on the energy that is out there? Because I very much agree with Dio that there's a huge difference between having your voice heard in the streets and in the media, or actually being represented uh, when decisions are being made. But what can we do? What can people do who are wanting to who want to change something um and who are listening to this conversation right now what can we do yeah for sure i mean look i, I think let's the positives are as as we've rightly said and as i said you know young people do care about issues that affect them and without wanting to repeat everything that Dai has already said you know you see it with the the movements around sort of climate you see it with you know black lives matter um you know with, with the women's march and, and many other issues too around the world and I think that's really positive, even when you look at sort of the Brexit referendum, I think one of the biggest um, positive impacts from it has been is that it's politicised a generation. You saw it with Scotland in the Scottish referendum. It politicised a young generation. And, you know, what we need to do now is just to tap into how we can, you know, garner that enthusiasm and really sort of put it into a constructive um, action. What I would say is I think one thing that we haven't touched upon on this conversation is that there is a lot of really good practice of how young people are involved um at decision making at a local level and um, so you know whilst we may not necessarily see the same numbers at a national level you know i myself for example i'm a 28 year old in, in hackney i'm responsible for a budget of over 120 million pounds in terms of how we distribute you know um, how we uh, shape our response to climate change our energy um, production our waste collections our transport system so i run the whole road network uh, bus network train network in hackney um, I oversee one and a half thousand employees in Hackney. So I think there are really good examples and there's lots of people like me across the country, believe me, who are sort of in their mid twenties um, or sort of early thirties who are actually in, in decision-making uh, in powers. And I think, you know, there's there's really good examples of that. So I think there are, I think through the local government route, we, we're seeing much more innovation and young people being involved. And actually I think in many ways, it's probably more important than national uh, politics. And I say that because it impacts your day-to-day -day life, um, you know, so you get to really have, make a difference on people's day-to-day -day lives, whereas national policy is much more, a bit more kind of a, of a long-term thing. So I think what we need to do is really think about how do we kind of take that enthusiasm uh, that we're seeing from young people and really turn it into social action. And, you know, Obama's presidential campaign in 2008 was, a really real life example anyone who hasn't had a chance to to look into his uh, presidential campaign in 20, uh, 2008 you should really look into it because it was a real you know combined hybrid approach of you know having the campaigning element and activism but then it was also very much married with how do you actually make a difference in your community and linking it back right to your lo local decision making process uh, so i think there's loads of good examples that we can learn from to build on yes Yes, I, I completely agree with you. And the Obama um, campaign is a great example of how um, something that seems so big and so far away um, can sometimes be really small if you just start in your own community and your own street and 
um, it, it's a great example. Um, at the end of the session, uh, we are going to share um, the tips and tricks to people who are listening to us right now. Uh, because I can imagine that some people listening um, are thinking, okay, I want to do something. So after the session ends, what can I do? So um, you will receive a few tips and tricks from us at the end. But now we are going to move to the Q&A. Um, we have been receiving a couple of questions and um, that's one um, that immediately stood out to me. Um, Dario, um, what do you say to young people who turn away a life in politics because of the public exposure that comes with it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a difficult one, but I, I guess um, it, it's one of perspective. I think um, you know, the question of, uh, you know, exposure on public life, for me, is one of integrity. Um, and for me, I've always prided myself on having uh, high values, you know, in public sight and out of public sight. Uh, and that shouldn't change, uh, whether you're in politics or whether you're not in politics. I, I do admit, since, um, you know, joining the House of Lords uh, five years ago, um, you know, stuff has radically changed. Yeah, you know, I assumed responsibilities I didn't necessarily uh, for, think I would uh, assume, and I, um, you know, had I picked up certain responsibilities, you know, to where I'm from, to my continent, to my race. You, you, you take certain, you assume certain responsibilities, and to whom much is given, much is required. I say, um, you know, there is, you're not, you're not alone. And there are many of us that that feel the same way, um, and and I don't think it's something to shy away from. I think it's something to embrace, uh, to grow in character, to actually look around at those myself, Mete, those who have actually entered into different political spectrums uh, and seen it as, as an opportunity to change our generation. And I think once you look at that call, that's much bigger than um, you know. For me personally, it's much bigger than you know trying to preserve, uh, you know part of my, my identity, uh, you know, it's much bigger than that. I have bigger integrity and values that I, I see and a bigger mission at hand. Well, that, thank you. Um, and that is actually a very inspiring answer. Um, but running for office can also make you feel very vulnerable at times. Um, so Mette, would you like to um, reflect on that? Yeah, I mean, look, I think running for office, you know, I was 20 when I first stood for election, so um, <laughs> I didn't realise how young I was. I, it's only now that I think back and I think, wow, you know, I was really fearless at the time to, to put myself forward for that. Um, you know, look, inevitably, people are always going to question your experience and your knowledge um, about, you know, being a, a person to be um, a decision maker. And I think, you know, there's two ways to deal with that. You let that affect you and impact you. And of course, you know, it's not as easy as said, um, obviously, I'm, as I'm saying right now. But, you know, the way I always took that approach was really to try to prove people wrong. You know, I come from a place called Hackney, uh, which, in, you know, in my eyes, is one of the most beautiful places to grow up and grow old in. But in reality, it's a place that has felt so many children and young people for the most brutal face of social inequality. And, you know, for, for many people like me, I, I was really passionate about standing up for my community. And that was what really led me and still drives me to this day uh, to push through that. And, you know, there are so many examples of things that I can give you where, you know, you're continuously undermined. Uh, people, you know, question your ability or your knowledge or your experience, as I say. You know, even recently, I sat with, um, I recently got appointed to the cabinet by the mayor. And um, when I sat in front of one of my uh, transport uh, engineers, you know, the first question he asked me was, you know, councillor, how much do you know about transport? And, you know, my response to him was, um, you know, do you think it's appropriate that you um, that you ask me the question about how much do I know about transport? You know, if you were sitting in front of the minister for transport, would you ask him how much do you know about transport? And obviously he's asking me that question because, you know, he, he probably thinks in his mind, you know, this is someone who's got a little life experience, doesn't really know about policy um, specifically. Um, so look, you're always gonna face challenges like that. Uh, but I think the one thing that you should always do whenever you're at a moment where it's low, is always go back to that moment uh, which inspired you to get into politics. And for me, 
you know, I always give this story, but um, when I was a younger kid, uh, my father um, used to uh, <clears throat> work cash in hand. And um, when he used to work cash in hand, there was many, there was a case where specifically where I witnessed um, him getting underpaid. And when he gets, when he got underpaid, ever since that day, I made it my mission to make sure that, you know, no, no father or child ever has to go through that again. So whenever I feel at a very low moment or I feel, you know, whether it's vulnerable or feel like, you know, I'm being undermined, it's really important that you kind of can reflect back to that moment to kind of give you that drive to push you forward. Yeah, you, you go back to why you started this in the first place and why you feel it's important that you want to make uh, a difference. Um, thank you both for your very honest answers. Um, I, I appreciate it very much. Um, another question, it's a very practical one, um, because running for office can be a very expensive endeavor. Um, so both uh, money and time-wise. Um, so Dio, what advice can you give to any young aspiring candidates? Yeah, I'd, I'd say um, reach out to those who have gone before you. So uh, do your research, um, do your work, find out those who have similar interests and alignment to you uh, and reach out, send them a note. You'd be surprised um, at how many people reach out to me uh, for various reasons and, and if I don't know the answer, I can connect them to someone who knows the answer or, or who has a pool of resources to support your campaign. So uh, don't be afraid, always reach out, always tap into your networks. Um, but then if you don't have networks, then, you know, uh, find me online and somehow and, and reach out and I'm sure, you know, you can reach out to Mete as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I think that applies to all of us. Um, uh, that sometimes people are a bit shy um, to get in touch with, uh, with, for example, members of parliament or uh, the people who went before them. But every time when someone reaches out to me, if, if sometimes it's someone that you know because you went to the same university or sometimes there's no connection at all you're always willing to help because you know how tough things can be and um yeah well you're always willing to help so please do um mete and dio i would like to move to the final five minutes of this session because i hope that we inspired people listening to us that they um want to become politically active as well i mean they are tuning into this session so obviously they are already interested in politics um so i would like like all of us to share some very hands-on tips and tricks of things that people can do uh today already if they want to become politically active themselves or if they maybe want to empower others um, to run for office. Um, so Meteo, is there advice that you can give to people listening now? Yeah, so the first thing that I would say is really try to identify, it's a bit like business, right? Really look at the market or like, you know, out there in the world and think, okay, so why do I want to be a politician? What issues is it that I care about? And, you know, inevitably, look, a lot of us will care about a lot of issues. So we could sit here and talk about, you know, the future of the, the world of work, you know, climate change, BLM, racial equality. We could talk about all of these issues. But what you really need to do, I mean, it's a bit like business, is really think, OK, what are the two or three things that I really want to focus on and really want to create a name for myself in? And what's being currently done around those issues and what can I bring different to the table? So it's like business, right? It's like the delivery and just, just the <clears throat> argument where, you know, delivery added the component where you can actually see the driver and also the, you know, the, the famous restaurants on it as well, whereas Just Eat didn't have that. And that was what set them apart. It wasn't necessarily a new idea. So I think when you're looking at getting into politics as well, it's really thinking about, okay, what are the issues that you, so myself as Mete Koban, what do I want to be known for? When people say my name, do they want to say, okay, Mete is the guy that I go to for, um, like youth engagement or for climate change and then what are you going to do in those specific areas and then specifically to, to going on to be to be uh to going to stand for office look i mean there's so many things i could say and please do get in touch with me um, i don't want to sort of take too much time because i know we're short for time but what i would say is look believe in yourself really discover why why is it you and no one else should be you know why should you be a candidate and no one else like really think about that question because ultimately people will ask you that you know why is it that i should choose you dial 
and not, uh, you know, I don't know, Adam or John or whoever it is. Um, and you really need to be able to set yourself apart from that. And then the final thing is, the other question you've got to ask yourself is, do you truly, really believe that you could change the world to be a better place? Um, and I say that's really important was because throughout politics, you will go through lots of ups and downs. Um, and it's really, really, really important that you can continue to drive yourself. Um, and that's why I say, if you can hang on to those moments that you know that you know that really push you forward, you know, keep those in the locker because you know you're going to need that um, in your journey of politics. Yes, I agree very much. Thank you, um, Dio. What's any advice that you would like to share? Yeah, I mean, uh, educate yourself. Educate yourself on uh, politics, on you know different political parties. Uh, become a member of a political party. Uh, you know, join a, a political think tank, uh, you know, research these things, understand uh, what happens in the world of politics uh, and share, share on social media, share with friends. If you personally don't feel you have uh, the capacity or skills to, to be front man in politics, then support someone, find out who's next up and coming, budding with politics, find out who needs support, reach out. Uh, and when there's an opportunity to vote, make sure you vote, make sure you encourage others to vote. Uh, make sure you set up systems uh, <clears throat> where you can, uh, you know, encourage the multitude of, of young people to vote and utilize that. I have one quote um, by a German playwright, uh, which which I always, uh, when I give these talks, end with. It's uh, a playwright called Bertolt Brecht, and and he says, "The worst illiterate in the political is the political illiterate. He doesn't hear, doesn't speak, nor participates in the political events." He doesn't know the cost of life, the price of a bean, the price of fish, the price of flour, the price of rent, or of shoes and of medicine. It all depends on political decisions. The political illiterate is so stupid that he is proud and swells his chest saying that he hates politics. The imbecile doesn't know that from, the, from his political ignorance is born the prostitute, the abandoned child, and then the worst thieves of all, the bad politician corrupted and the flunky of national and multinational companies. So please, my friends, educate yourself on politics, get involved in politics. Thank you. Thank you, Dio. And remember, when you're not at the table, you are on the menu. Um, I am going to uh, wrap this up. Thank you, Dio and Meta, so much for joining me today. Thank you, Cogex and One Young World. Um, and I'm going to uh, hand this over to Sephora. Oh gosh, I've been enjoying this session so much. Um, and I, I'm really am humbled by you three because it really is up to individuals like yourself to create a culture of trust around politics um, and to shatter those perceptions that politics are fundamentally elitist. Um, there are some key takeaways I just wanted to highlight for, for our audience. The education that we get needs reform so that we can have the life skills needed for our life in politics. In order to sustain change, we have to establish legislation that allows us to address the issues people are protesting about. To those of you who are passionate activists, you have to understand it doesn't translate into actual policy change. So get involved in the policy change process. To lead in today's world of politics, you have to lead with integrity in and outside of your life. If you're not at the table, then you're not on the menu. I'll repeat that final time. And don't hesitate to reach out to people in office because many of them truly want to help open doors for people like you. So thank you, the three of you, for your excellent session. Um, and we're now going to be taking a short break. So for those of you watching, don't go too far. You can check out the virtual expo booths on Hopin. But please join us back um, in just under 20 minutes for the next session, where we'll be discussing how to get your first job in today's world. Thanks so much.